Hey, hi everybody. Um, first off, I want to say it's so great to be here in person with all of you, and big thanks to the Airflow Summit and Amazon for hosting us tonight. I'm super excited about this event. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about event-based DAGs uh, in Airflow, and also want to shout out to everybody who's joining us via Crowdcast uh, tonight. If you have any questions, throw those in the chat as I'm going through so that we can make sure to uh, answer them at the end. We will be leaving time for Q&A there. Um, there we go. Uh, so start off just with a bit of an introduction. Um, turns out I'm Kenton Danis. I'm a lead developer advocate at Astronomer. Um, I have worked uh, with Airflow for quite a long time, starting way back when I was a data engineering consultant. Um, I moved on to work for quite a long time as a field engineer at Astronomer. So I've had a lot of time talking to lots of different companies who have implemented Airflow before I moved into this lead developer advocate role. Um, so uh, Again, lots of time spent with uh, many different companies who have implemented Airflow kind of at all scales, uh, which has been you know, really fun and have really liked uh, getting to really help people uh, learn how to use Airflow to um, you know, uh, customize Airflow for their use cases. And so part of that, uh, in my mind, helping people adopt Airflow is really making sure that they know what all of the features of Airflow are and how they can use them. Um, so one of the things that has come up uh, in my field work uh, kind of again and again is whether or not you can use Airflow to implement event-based DAGs, so things that are not run on a schedule. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to go through kind of the you know, what and the why. So what do we mean when we say event-based DAGs and why you might want to use event-based triggering? Um, I'm going to walk through kind of different methods for implementation that I've seen work really well uh, at different places with sort of an eye towards uh, you know, use case and cost optimization. Uh, and then I'll end by, you know, sort of looking forward towards future development within Airflow that is going to make this experience even better. So to start off, just a level set, probably pretty obvious for most people who have worked with Airflow or even just in data engineering in general, but want to make sure we're all on the same page with what is event-based triggering, this thing that I'm going to talk about how to implement. And so when I say event-based, I mean, you know, anything that's not on a time um, schedule. So time-based scheduling would be, I start running when my race starts at 5 a.m. Um, event-based triggering would be, I start running when my teammate gets to me, or I see a bear and I start running. Um, so anything, again, that's not sort of on time-based, that's what we're talking about when we say event-based triggering. So something happens and I want to kick off my DAG. So the natural next question is, can you do that with Airflow? And uh, I'm guessing since we're here, you've gathered that the answer is yes, of course you can. Um, I like to joke that we hear a lot of people, you know, sort of joking that Airflow is fancy cron, uh, which uh, it certainly could be, but that's not all it is. So Airflow is a fully functional orchestrator. It does more than just schedule. Its job is to manage the running of all of your tasks. And not all tasks need to run on a schedule. And I also want to note that all of the solutions that I'm going to present today are based on fully supported Airflow features. So again, if you've used Airflow for a long time, these things might be very familiar to you. But I get a lot of questions from you know, newer Airflow users about, well, this isn't you know, just running with my schedule interval. Is this hacky? Or can I feel confident doing this in production? And the answer is, for everything that we're going to present today, yes. These are all, again, fully supported features. So before we dive into sort of the how, um, let's talk about why. So why would you want to use event-based triggering? Um, there's really infinite answers to this. So running DAGs on an ad hoc basis can be helpful for many applications. Probably a lot of you have run into them in your own, um, at your own companies uh, with your own use cases. Uh, at Astronomer, some of the things that I've seen come up again, again, and again are you know, if you have a website where uh, potential customers are filling out some sort of form and you want to process that data as soon as, soon as it comes through, um, obviously that doesn't lend itself well to having a schedule. You have no idea when people are going to fill out that form. You don't want to be waiting uh, for that data to show up. Uh, another one that I see a lot uh, is using Airflow for a machine learning orchestration. Uh, so that tends to you know, generate interdependencies between DAGs. You might have a DAG that's doing your model training uh, and publishing. You might have another DAG that's doing reporting based on the results of that model. And obviously, model training times can vary a lot. Um, so you don't want those, you know, downstream dependent DAGs to be running before the data is actually there. Um, again, I could spend this entire talk and this entire evening going through potential use cases. 
uh, for event-based triggering. I won't bore you with that. Um, but these are some things, again, that uh, to think about that I've seen sort of frequently come up. Um, so natural question, how can I make my DAGs event-based? Um, and the answer to this is uh, it varies, and we're going to talk about all of the different methods. So again, I'm going to go through, and I'm going to kind of start from the simpler methods and then work our way up to more complex and also sort of uh, appropriate for more complex use cases. Um, with an eye towards sort of the pros and cons for each. So you get a sense of, you know, what the options are and when you might want to use them. Um, so the first one I'm going to cover, again, starting with super simple, uh, is the trigger DAG run operator. Um, again, something that I've learned uh, working in the field a lot with Airflow is that people don't always know that these features exist, um, even though they're, again, fully supported, they're part of Airflow. And... This is one that I've brought up a lot as um, it's super, super functional. So uh, trigger DAG run is going to be good for when your trigger event comes from another DAG. Um, does have to come from another DAG in the same environment. Uh, but if that's you know, your relevant use case, you have some sort of cross DAG dependency. So like that ML example that I talked about before, um, or any other cross DAG dependency really that you want to implement. Uh, again, your dependent DAG shouldn't really run on a schedule because you want it to run when the uh, upstream one completes. This is going to be a great option there. Um, implementing it is as simple as adding an operator into your DAG um, and you know, providing the ID of the DAG that you're going to trigger. Uh, because it's that simple, pros of this method, um, again, super easy to implement. You do have parameters kind of built in here, like this wait for completion that are going to give you options to sort of implement more complex DAG dependencies. So if you need to, say, trigger a DAG in the middle of another DAG and you need to wait for it, you can do that. Um, it doesn't have to be at the end. Um, the main con to this option is both your controller and trigger DAGs must be in the same airflow environment. So um, if you have DAG dependencies, but they're running in different airflows, um, this isn't going to work. Or if you need to if your trigger event isn't coming from another DAG, also not the best option for you. So next one is going to be sort of more functional for different, um, different use cases and probably the most familiar to uh, people who are already using Airflow, and that's sensors. Um, so sensors are you know, a special kind of operator that are going to wait for something to happen. Um, and I like to say that sensors are good in event-based triggering when you're not quite sure of the right time. So I'll talk more about that in a second. But in terms of how you implement them, um, again, they're just going to be like another uh, operator in your DAG. They're going to be highly use case specific. So what you actually put in that sensor um, is going to depend on what it's waiting for. Relevant use cases here are things like, uh, I want to process data only after it has arrived in S3, GCS, something like that. Um, or you want to run your DAG after an external service has completed. Uh, so maybe something like an Azure Data Factory job or a SageMaker job, um, or this one we have here, the DBT cloud job run. Um, so I have something happening external to Airflow. I need that to finish before my DAG runs. Um, sensors are going to be a great way to implement that. Um, Pros of this, again, effectively just another operator in your DAG, so they tend to be pretty easy to implement. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they are highly use case specific, uh, which is great. So if a sensor exists for your use case, you're probably not going to have to implement a lot of logic or a lot of code yourself. Um, so super easy lift on the part of the user. Uh, a potential con we have here is that if a sensor doesn't exist for your particular use case, then you're kind of out of luck unless you want to write your own, which you totally can. If you do, you should contribute it back to Airflow. But um, that's obviously a bigger lift kind of on the part of the user. Um, other sort of downsides to working with sensors for event-based triggering are probably the biggest limitation. Um, once the sensor has received that first event that says, OK, my event has completed, my file landed in S3, I'm going to move on. It's going to mark that task as success, and then you're done for that DAG run. Um, so if you have a situation where you want to you know, run your DAG um, every time a file lands in S3, and those might be landing you know, every couple of minutes uh, or even more frequent, if you want to use sensors, you're going to have to manage that event-based triggering with both the sensor and with your DAG schedule. So that can require some sort of architecting to make sure that that um, gets set up right, which can be a little tricky. The other main con here is that um, long-running sensors can 
incur high resource costs. So if that's part of why I say that sensors are great in the cases where um, you want your DAG to be event-based, but you know generally when it's going to run. You just don't know exactly when it's going to run. Um, you probably don't want a sensor sitting there for like tons and tons of time taking up your compute. Uh, but that does bring me to the next option, which if sensors are really good for your use case, but you're concerned about that compute, you can look to deferrable operators. So these are available in as of Airflow 2.2. And really, I should have written this to say deferrable sensors, because that's what we're talking about here. But in general, as a feature, deferrable operators are going to function just like their analogous regular operators or sensors, but they're going to release their worker slot when uh, they're waiting for that work to happen. Um, so that frees you up to you know, have that worker slot for both uh, more computing, um, and that means you know more scalability, and it also means cost savings. So you're not taking up all that compute while you're just sitting there waiting for something to happen. Um, so ideal for when you know sensors are the right thing for your event-based triggering, uh, but the waiting part is expensive. Um, how you implement these again, super similar. Um, deferrable operators and sensors are actually designed to just plug right into where their analogous uh, regular sensor would live. So all you should have to do is change, um, you know, the the name of the operator or the name of the sensor uh, and your import path, and you should be off and running. Uh, pros of deferrable sensors, um, again, major compute savings uh, over traditional sensors. So again, that's going to help you with both scalability and cost. Um, implementing them is pretty straightforward. Um, downsides to this method. So you do have to have one written, again, just kind of like a sensor, although writing a deferrable sensor is uh, potentially a bit more complicated than writing a regular sensor. So if one doesn't already exist, um, that could be you know, more lift to implement for your team. Uh, you also have to have a trigger running. So that is a process that runs you know, separately from your Airflow scheduler that's going to manage that deferment of those operators. Depending on how you're running Airflow, it may or may not be any lift to set that up. Um, a lot of managed Airflow services do have a trigger package with them. So uh, that might already be running in your environment. But if not, you'll have to make sure it is and manage that. Um, and again, they're not the best for sort of truly ad hoc uh, situations. Um, again, you probably don't want a deferrable operator sitting there for days waiting for something to happen. You might build in logic to make sure that that doesn't happen. But if you truly don't know when um, your DAG is going to need to trigger, probably not the best option. So for that, go with my last, again, sort of most complicated and um, also most sort of functional option for deferrable operators, and that is the Airflow API. Um, so this is going to be best for when the trigger event is truly random. Uh, so you have no idea when you're going to need to trigger, um, or if the event is coming from outside of Airflow. Uh, so you can, can also obviously make an API call from inside of Airflow from another DAG, if that's what makes sense for your use case. Uh, but it's going to be your best option for triggering a DAG from somewhere else entirely. Um, so obviously how to implement, um, it depends on what service you're using to trigger the API. But in general, all you have to do is send a post request to that DAG runs endpoint. Um, this is going to be relevant for a lot of the use cases that I've talked about kind of throughout. So triggering a DAG when someone fills out a website form. Um, at Astronomer, we've worked with uh, companies that have you know, teams of analysts that need to run queries, and Airflow is doing the orchestration of those. But those analysts don't know Python. They don't really work with Airflow. Um, so they'll build plugins that will use the API under the scenes to actually do all of the Airflow DAG triggering um, when analysts submit queries, things like that. So you have a ton of flexibility there. Um, I actually think generally the API is pretty underutilized in Airflow. It's a feature that a lot of people don't really uh, know is available. And one of the questions I get a lot about the API is, um, well, I've heard the API is experimental, so does that mean I shouldn't use it? And so that is, uh, comment is kind of a relic of Airflow pre-Airflow pre 2. So in Airflow 1.x, the API was experimental. Um, it is not experimental anymore. So the Airflow 2 API is a fully stable REST API. Um, so it is fully supported. Uh, you can definitely use it in production. Um, other pro, obviously, uh, with the API, you can trigger anytime from anywhere. So 
this is my personal opinion, but I think the best way to implement kind of truly ad hoc triggering, again, if that trigger, especially if it's coming from, you know, somewhere else outside of Airflow. Um, kind of downsides are things to keep in mind when using the API. Um, the request is only going to trigger the DAG, right? It's going to receive an event back that says, I triggered the DAG and that was successful. Um, it's not going to tell you whether the DAG succeeded or failed. Uh, it's not going to tell you whether it's complete or not or when it's complete. There are other API endpoints that will tell you that information, um, but you would have to build those in with other API calls. So that may or may not be kind of convenient or what you want to do from the service that you're triggering from. Um, the other thing, and I maybe shouldn't, this could maybe even actually go in the pros column, um, but so it's more of a, uh, note to um, anybody who's going to implement this, but uh, using the API requires configuring authentication before using. So if you go into your Airflow environment today and you haven't done anything, uh, you're not going to be successful because the default is going to be to deny all requests. That's in general actually a good thing, right? It's more secure that way. Um, but you will have to work you know, within your organization to figure out which authentication method that you want to use and set that up before using the API. So. Again, more just something kind of to keep in mind there. OK, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour of a bunch of different options for um, implementing event-based triggering. Again, one sort of common thread through those is that they're all relatively straightforward, right? They don't require a ton of lift on the part of the user to uh, you know, make uh, event-based triggering possible. However, they do require you to make some changes. So most of those methods are going to require you to add something to your DAG uh, or maybe add something to your other service. So looking forward, there's actually a couple of things that are um, in sort of early stages of Airflow development that will make this even more kind of inherent functionality so that you're you know, closer or more on par to uh, what you have with just adding a schedule to your DAG where it's just you know, a simple cron expression or um, one line of code. Um, so the first is future trigger features. So I mentioned the trigger when we went through the deferrable operators. So this is a process that's running, you know, external to your scheduler. And right now triggers work kind of like I said with sensors where, <coughs> excuse me, um, where once a sensor has, you know, sensed the event um, that it's waiting for, it says, okay, great, I received this, I'm done. Um, that's how triggers work currently. So once the trigger, uh, fires and resumes the operator, um, it's now done. So not super useful for um, triggering event-based DAGs now. However, it does the existence of the trigger and all of those processes does leave the door open for multi-event triggers, which means they will stay open and say, I'm going to fire whenever this happens, um, which means you could launch DAGs using that. Uh, method. So I actually lifted this note directly from the Airflow docs on the trigger. So um, again, something that is not uh, currently available, but definitely something to watch out for as uh, a really good option in the future. Um, the next is AIP48. And so AIP48 is about data awareness and data-driven scheduling. So um, AIP is out there. I uh, definitely recommend everybody go read it. It's super exciting stuff. The general concept behind it is that Airflow right now is uh, not, it orchestrates all of your tasks, but it has no idea what those tasks are doing. It doesn't care um, and it doesn't know. And so this AIP would change that. Um, so the idea is making Airflow actually aware of the data that's flowing through your DAGs um, sort of, and giving you the ability to define things like data sets so that it actually does know um, what data is being processed. Uh, the relevant goal for this talk with that is it would enable the uh, triggering of DAGs based on updates to your data set. So something like um, I've defined a data set that uh, is tracked in this DAG. If I have data that's added or removed or changed, um, that means I need to run my DAG and that's going to trigger automatically. So super excited uh, for this. AIP48 is uh, super early stages, but it is something that the Airflow community kind of has its eye on as um, a really cool uh, next step feature development. So um, we'll definitely want to keep an eye on that for, uh, again, more, um, more sort of options here going forward. And then I also want to throw out there that, so if you have thoughts on you know, AIP48 or um, future trigger features or any of the other methods that I've talked about today, well, 
actually, you can fill out the survey with anything you want about Airflow. It doesn't have to be what I'm talking about today. Um, but if you have thoughts about this, the Airflow user survey that happens annually is currently open. Um, it's open until June 3rd, so you have another week. Um, please go fill it out. The Airflow community really wants to hear what you think. Um, a lot of AIPs that have been uh, developed and released as part of you know, Airflow 2.0, Airflow 2.2, Airflow 2.3 um, came as the result of uh, things that the community had heard from these user surveys. So it's your best way to um, kind of fill out uh, you know, how your Airflow experience is going and what you want to see in the project. Um, so I'm still talking so that anybody can write down this URL uh, if you want to go fill it out um, right now. But again, you have another week. The Airflow PMC really cares about this. Uh, so definitely do that if you have any thoughts. Um, and with that, I will open it up to any questions.